Okay, so we're in a series called Room for More because we're making room for more in our lives of God's presence and God's power, and we want to be useful. We don't want to just sit and come to these church meetings once a week. We actually believe that if we follow Jesus, it should change Monday through Sunday, and and we should live differently, and we should act differently, and we should be useful in ways that we weren't before because when Jesus comes and makes his home, so to speak, in our life and world, things change for the good. So how? How do I... How do I make room for more of God's presence? We saw last week that God's presence comes to us by his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit transforms the way that we think, the way that we feel, and in the end, the way that we live. So what we're doing is we're slowing down in Romans 12 to look at this one segment where Paul lists out to this community of young Jesus followers. The Holy Spirit is in you and among you, and look at what the Holy Spirit does. So we're taking between now and the end of the year to just unpack a bit of what God has said about what God wants to do in you. And I hope that it's transformative. I hope this like rocks your world a little bit and builds you up so that you can start the new year with a fresh vision for your life in God. All right, so Romans 12, let's look at it, verses 5 through 8. And we're going to look at just one statement, but we'll read the whole package. Romans 12, 5 to 8. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Jesus the Messiah, which is the word Christ, in Jesus the Messiah, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Well, last week we looked broad spectrum of what Paul describes as these gifts or these manifestations, these appearings of the Holy Spirit in in various forms. And he lists out a few, prophesying and uh, uh, teaching and serving and giving and leading. There are very various ways where God's presence shows up in your life, through your life, for the good of others. I want to recap three thoughts from last week that if you missed it, please podcast, uh, online, free, download it. And, and get the foundation. But I'll recap three thoughts. One, the Holy Spirit is the gift. So when we talk about giftings, we're not talking about you being super skilled. We're saying the Holy Spirit is God's gift to us. And when God's presence is with us, he will show himself to be strong in various ways. So the charisma or the gifts are less about us and more about God and his presence. It's about honoring God. And honoring that God chooses to use you for the common good. Second thing, the Holy Spirit works through every Jesus follower. So any conversation about gifting, appearing, manifestation, these are various Bible words, has more to do with Jesus using all of us and less about a few super skilled people. Look at what the text said. In Christ, though we are many, we form one body. And each member belongs to all the others, even though we have different gifts. So it's Jesus working through all of us. So I'll just pause and remind you. If you are in Jesus, you have been given God's spirit. Therefore, you're not allowed to say, even though you feel like it, you're not allowed to say, God can't use me. You just can't say it. Well, you can't say it with an honesty and integrity because, wait a minute, if you're in the body and you're connected, already you have a function. God formed you to build up the bigger thing called his body, his people. So it's it's really about discovering ways that God is going to use you for the good of others. And and the third thought, the Holy Spirit empowers us to continue Jesus' work. All of these things that we saw in Romans 12, and we'll see over the next few weeks, prophecy and serving and leadership, all of them, are continuations of Jesus. Jesus spoke God's words. 
And so God gives us words to speak. Jesus served, empowered by the Spirit, so we serve. Jesus led, so we lead. Jesus gave, so we give. These aren't new things. These are what Jesus, when you read the pages, this is what Jesus was about. Guess what? God has empowered us for the good of others. So it's all about realizing you've got a place, and it's less about you being like, wow, look at what I've got now that I'm in Jesus. It's more about look at Jesus' family and look how I get to contribute. Look what Jesus is doing and look what, look what part I get to play in the bigger story. Now, we're going to look at the first one listed, prophecy, which is, which is hugely misunderstood or just we have all sorts of stereotypes of what it's about. So we're going to look at it today. And I'm going to say a disclaimer. We come from all sorts of backgrounds. I just say the word prophecy and some are going, oh, yeah. Some are going, huh? Some are going, no. You know, like, just don't, don't, don't go there. I'm not, I'm not ready. Well, get ready. So we're going to look at it because we want to see, again, less about the gift and more about God and how God is God through us for the good of other people. So that's, that's the goal. To do that, 1 Corinthians 14 is probably, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 have the most um, teaching about what prophecy is. So we'll start there. I'm just going to look at the beginning and the end. Too much time to do all of 1 Corinthians 14. Maybe we'll come back soon and look at it. First three verses. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire charisma or the manifestations or the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially prophecy. So it's got like a, a special meaning. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but God. Indeed, no one understands them because they utter mysteries by the Holy Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their three things, strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So we see that Paul is teaching a church that had some struggles with understanding what the Holy Spirit is doing when people do this thing. So he, he lays out. Now let me just go to the end. Go to the last couple of verses, 39 and 40. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, so he gives all this in between. I'm just going to the beginning and the end. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Don't forbid the speaking of tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Way too much to look at today on, on all of the teaching about, about prophecy and tongues and how that work, works. But I just want to set the groundwork. Paul needed to instruct them because in some areas they were doing really well and they got it and it was building people up. In other areas they were slightly misguided or ignorant, and so some people were, were bring, being hurt in the process. So this is a good thing to remember. There's room to grow. You may be saying, well, I never heard of, what, I never heard of prophecy. Great, there's room to grow. Oh, I was a part of church that did that, and I escaped, and I came here, and now you're dropping a bomb. Why are you doing that? Well, there's room to grow. There's room to learn. I think we all are like the Jesus people in the city called Corinth. Some were getting right, some were getting wrong, some were doing well, some were ignorant, and there's room to grow. So God actually gives us instructions on mess-ups. That's so encouraging. The implication here is the church wasn't getting it right, therefore neither do we. We don't have to get it right. What we need to do is grow, therefore the phrase, there's room for more. There's room for us to grow, all right? What I want us to see from 1 Corinthians 14 is that prophecy to Paul, when it comes to people coming together, is at the top of the list. Now, I told you last week that the various functions, the various ways God works, there's no better one than the other. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. We need each other. Yet, Paul gives us a secret, God's secret. Oh, yeah, by the way, all of them are important, but some have a super benefit. And when, when you're eager to prophesy, when you grow in prophecy, actually this could be really helpful. 
So what we're going to look at today is what could be a great gift and tool for us as God's people to build each other up and strengthen each other. Because we're new to this, we normally take one part of the Bible and we look at it really carefully. But instead, I'm going to do q and I'm going to pretend you're asking me questions because I can read your thoughts. I can't, actually. I can't. But I know what you're thinking because I'm human too, okay? Q&A format on what prophecy is. So take some good notes this morning. First question, what is prophecy? Two definitions I have found helpful. These aren't the only definitions. I just think they're helpful. Uh, prophecy is the human report of a divine revelation. That sounds a little fancy, but just catch the human and divine. It's from God, but we're saying it. Another one, Wayne Grudem, telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. Prophecy in the New Testament, and in particular in Corinthians and in Romans, is not so much about predicting the future. Some think, well, like, well, there's prophecies about the end of the world, and I hear that, and I cringe. Or I hear that, and I'm intrigued. Well, in biblical prophecy, there is some in Revelation about a seeing of what's to come. There, that is part of it. But the bulk of what Paul's talking about isn't that. It's about God communicating things and somehow giving his kids something in the moment about what he's saying so that we'll be aware and we could be built up. We could actually have like insight onto what God may want us to do now because the Bible was written for your good, but it actually wasn't written to you and that's not a slam. The Bible was written to people long ago. First Corinthians was written to a church in Corinth. Real people, real place. Now, God uses the words written to them to build us up. But how do I know, like, in our technological age, what to do here and now? God has given us his Holy Spirit, so there are moments where it will be helpful for us to know in this moment, what am I supposed to do? And thus, this whole idea of prophecy. Now, let's distinguish between prophecy, capital P, and lowercase. I'm not going to confuse you. we got a screen to help. Prophecy or prophets, capital P, there are people in the Bible called the prophets. There is prophetic literature. There's Isaiah. There's Jeremiah. There's Samuel. Jesus was a prophet, capital P. That is new truth revealed by God, including and especially God's plan to save. How would Isaiah know what the Messiah, Jesus, was going to look like? God gave him new truth to tell the people 700 years before Jesus, you want to know when Messiah comes? These will be the signs, new truth. And so, so how, would, how would the early disciples know what the plan of salvation is? God revealed it to them. He's given us scripture, so capital P, is what the people in Scripture wrote or spoke that's now been given to us. And that ends with Scripture. So in one sense, capital P is done. And guess what? This is good news. I've got what God wants me to know. I, I have it. What God wants you to know to grow is not ethereal. It's here. He spoke through the prophets in various times and in various ways so that you would know his heart you can count on capital P. But at the same token, what Paul gives us is that the same Holy Spirit that inspired capital P, prophets, to have new information is also working in prophecy or the prophetic, which is in line with, it doesn't contradict, it's in line with, but it's less than the Bible. So, I can totally count on everything God has said, but since lowercase prophecy or the prophetic is imperfect, it has to be, hear me, it has to be discerned. It has to be thought about and some of it has to be received and some of it has to be rejected. And that's okay because just because I use the word doesn't mean it always, always means the same thing. So capital P prophet, you can count on it. Lowercase p, I can count on it if it's discerned. Make sense? 
Okay, so that's a little bit of a, a, a background. Now, who, who gets to prophesy? That's the big question. Here's the good news. Any Jesus follower. How do I know? Acts 2. Peter is giving this first message. The Spirit has come, and as he preaches his first message in Acts 2, he says, and I quote, this is just a fulfillment of in the last days. God says, I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit on all people, and what's it going to look like? And he's quoting, notice, Peter is quoting capital P prophet Joel. God spoke to Joel hundreds of years beforehand that your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So anyone can. Men and women, young and old. It doesn't mean everyone will, but it does mean prophecy, biblical prophecy that you and I should engage in isn't just for a few and it isn't just for guys and it isn't just for older. It's for all of those who've been given the Holy Spirit. It's possible that they would prophesy. So it's just, it's not for just a couple of people. Okay, so if it's possible, where does prophecy come from? Like how, how do I know this is from God? 1 Corinthians 14, 30. And if, and Paul uses this word, a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop, for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. A prophecy is a revelation. It's something that God spontaneously brings to mind. It's a human telling of a divine word. God in the moment. Now I want you to notice the instruction there. If someone gets the revelation, the first person stops, they can prophesy in turn. So this gives us the reminder. It's not like your body's taken over and somehow you're not in control. Those who are, who are operating in this moment of prophecy are able to actually stop. They can actually speak. So when we're talking about the gifts or the manifestations or the appearings of the Holy Spirit, what we're not saying is suddenly I'm taken over and in a trance and, and God is doing that because that would freak me out. What we're saying is because God is with us and God is working in us, in the moment he can work through us, but guess what? I can stop and I can start. So when you see uncontrollable behavior, be discerning. When you see things that are like, whoa, this person looks as if they are out of their mind. They may be. Because what you don't see is out of control. He says, one should go, the next should go. And by the way, two or three and you're done. Stop it. Which means they can wait until later. Huh. So hopefully this is going, okay, so this is not as kooky or as uncommon as I thought. As a matter of fact, there's probably been, if you're a Jesus follower, prophetic activity in and around you and you probably didn't know it. You just thought, wow, man, I feel like God was with us. And it may have been some sort of prophecy. Now, I'm going to talk more about this when we get into teaching in a couple of weeks. But prophecy isn't a personal insight or intuition. It's, it's a moment where God reveals for the good of his kids. So why would God, why would God do this in the first place? Why would God reveal something? Okay. Why wouldn't God just tell me, right? Like, why does he have to use someone else? Because he's God. And he gets to do that. And could it be there are moments when we're not really open to God speaking to us? And in his goodness, he uses someone else to get our attention. Maybe we're just fatigued. Maybe we're just burned out. Maybe we're just filled with all these other things. And God in his love appears to us in subtle ways through someone else and says, I've got something for you to build you up. In essence, that's, that's what prophecy is all about. So what's the purpose? At least three things. At least three. First is to build up. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So the goal of prophecy, the purpose is that people would be encouraged. Now, I'll ask the broad question. If you knew 
that God was speaking about your situation this morning, not just generically to the human race or to Portland or whatever. What if you left here saying, oh my goodness, God knows what I'm going through and I know it. Would that encourage you? Well, in essence, the goal of prophecy is to build, it's to build up. Now, this happens in our community already. Uh, I'll give a couple examples. I was, um, it's probably a couple of months ago now, maybe even six it was at the end of a gathering, and I just walked off, took the microphone off, and a lady kindly came over to me, and I didn't know her well, I'd seen her before, and said, hey, you know, would it be okay if I shared something with you? I'm like, sure, and she was so kind and gentle about it, and said, hey, while we were in, in, in the gathering, uh, I was impressed that there was something I needed to tell you. Uh, are you. Would you be open? She was very kind about it. I could have said no, and she would have stopped. I was like, well, no, let me know. She said, I, I think that God was letting me know that there's something you're really concerned about, a big decision that you need to make, but he's already kind of given you the direction in, in where you should go. And so he, I think he just wants to remind you this morning that he knows what's on your heart and he's already led you in the way and he's there with you and he's for you. And that's not a quote, but that's how I remember it. And she's like, you know, does any of that make sense to you? I'm like, yes! Thank you. And I said, hey, would you just pray for me? And in that moment, she just paused and prayed that I would know God's presence. And it was very simple. And it was not weird at all. She had no idea I was going into a meeting that Tuesday making massive decisions about the direction in some very specific areas for our church. I had been wrestling with it. A bunch of us have been praying about it. And I left that gathering elated. I already knew that God had been kind of leaning me on some hard choices to make. But God used this beautiful sister to not tell me what to do, but to rather remind me of something that God had already been stirring. And I left totally encouraged. I'm like, you got anything else? I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm ready. That, in essence, is the nature of what prophecy is supposed to do. This March, I was in the UK. I was on my way to Romania for a week of mission. And I stopped off in the UK, and a friend that I was staying with goes to a pastor's gathering that meets like twice a month and said, hey, could you come and speak at it? I'm like, sure. So I went, just shared some encouraging stuff. They had their prayer time at the end. And like, hey, you're going on to Romania. Can we, can we pray for you? I'm like, absolutely. And so they're just praying. And one of the guys, I don't even know if he was one of the pastors or just there. I don't know. I never met him before said, you know, as we're just praying, I, I see that God's been using you in, in lots of ways and that I think in the season he wants to remind you that he, he's going to increase how he uses you in these gifts. He, again, I don't know him for anything, and he wants that to happen in and through your life and should just be encouraged that God wants to do more. And does any of that make sense? Like he had no idea that, that I had been praying for that and for our church. He had no idea. Four days later, I'm in Romania and some cool stuff happens that was beyond what had been happening. And it reminded me like, oh, God, in your goodness, you understand all time zones and all accents, you know. And so I stop in England, I think, to bless a couple of people. In turn, God uses his brother I've never met to remind me God's working and he wants to do some more. And then he does more four days later. So what I'm saying is, the essence of prophecy isn't telling the future. The essence is God gives a word in a moment that's from him for the good of someone else. And if that's new to you, that's, I think, the heart of what he's saying. It's in our hearts to long to hear the voice of God, isn't it? Like, if you're a Jesus follower, don't you want to know what God is saying? Don't, don't you want to know how God can work in your particular situation? Wouldn't it be encouraging if at times you got these confirming moments where, or uh, adjusting moments where you're like, wow, I'm not sure if I should do this, but God drops in and does something different. So it's, it's meant to build us up. Secondly, though, it's meant to warn. Prophecy can also be a warning. 1 Corinthians 14, 24, but if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in and while everyone's prophesying, here's what happens. They're convicted of sin, brought under judgment 
by all as, catch this phrase, the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. What's that? There are moments where God will work through any one of us, any one of us, to share something to someone else. Don't think gifts of the Spirit have to happen with a microphone. They're not like magic moments here, right? They're not Sunday things. These are just opportunities all throughout your life and all throughout your week where we're open, where if God spontaneously brings something to mind, it's a human description of a divine word, of where God, God is trying to encourage someone, sometimes that message to them could be a warning. A couple of months ago, if you were in this gathering, you'll know what I'm talking about. Right as we were about to get up, I had this thought, and it started slowly, and I was like, oh, that, that can't be right. And then it just wouldn't leave me. There's a guy in our church, and in my brain, I couldn't see his face. I didn't know his name, but I, could, I knew he was younger. There's a guy who's doubting whether God exists. And all God wanted them to know was he knows they've been asking, and he's real. How do you, how do you know he's real? You've been smoking weed thinking it's going to draw you closer to God. Instead, God wants you to know he wants to give you his very spirit. You don't need weed to, to somehow connect with God. God wants you to know who he is. Now, if that doesn't sound weird to you, then you're weird, okay? <laughs> I'm going to throw it out there. That, so choices to make. Now, I've got to talk for 40 minutes after saying that. It is much easier just to say, dumb thought, Erase, move on. But I had this, this impression that that was for someone in our community. So what do you do? You take a step of faith, and because I happen to be one of the leaders here, I, I know amongst our team, I usually go to one of our leaders and say, hey, it's about to happen. And, and like, <laughs> right? You, you, just like, you have these moments where some of our leaders will know, like, hey, just, do you trust me? So it's based on trust. This is not suddenly, hey, God is, this is not that. This is like God bringing something to mind and we have to step out in faith to, to share what we think he's saying. So I shared it and I said, look, if that's you, could you just reach out to me? Now, of course, I said at the end of the gathering. Now, in retrospect, that was kind of dumb because if someone comes beelining to me, that's, you know, like, who's going to Jose? That's just a, that's a weird moment. That's a weird moment. So what happened was I got an email by the end of the gathering. So he went to the website, got my email, never met this guy. It was his first time in our gathering. First time. He had been wondering. He grew up in a Christian home, and he had gone to a Christian school, but he was on the verge of throwing out his faith. Hadn't been to church in months. Came here because he liked a girl. <laughs> hmm. That could be you. <laughs> Don't judge me. So he, he came here, and what, what, hap what happened in his life? He had been wrestling, is God really there? He and all his buddies had been smoking weed that they all do in their house, right? And in one of these little trips, he got freaked out a bit. Then he opened his Bible to Isaiah. He started reading these obscure passages in Isaiah. And let me tell you, read Isaiah. It's all obscure. These obscure passages... And it was coming to life like, oh my gosh, God is real. Then he reads this obscure passage in Job. And I'm like, it made no sense to me. And it's like, what about this, man? So, so he's thinking, well, wow, maybe smoking weed is kind of helpful. Because I'm connecting. Maybe God is out there. So some guy he's never met gets up and says, God said you don't need to smoke weed to know me. I want to give you the Holy Spirit. Do you not realize what's going on in this guy's world? So he emails me, and I'm like, I'd love to meet with you if you want. I don't want to make it weird. He's like, yes, I'd love to meet. So we met the next Sunday here. And his, his thing was, and I'm not kidding. He's like, did God give you my name? <laughs> I'm like, no, I wish he did. <laughs> because I would, He's like, is that real? Like, how did you know? I'm like, I didn't know. He's like, are you sure? I didn't know. But here's what I know. 
if God would tell me something I didn't know, maybe he's trying to get your attention. And if I were you, I wouldn't ignore him. (laughs) Because he was kind and he was loving. And if you ignore him, he may get your attention in other ways that may be more dramatic. I would encourage you. And he repented of his sin. He was baptized two weeks later. He lives in another side of town. Let me know. Came here on a Sunday afterwards. Say, I was baptized. And he's connected with other Jesus followers. And he's walking with God. Now, does it always happen that dramatically? No. It doesn't. And I told him, I said, there's a few times in my life where it's been that specific and that dramatic. So God must really care about you because this is not like an everyday thing. All I'm saying is not everyone will have a word in the moment that's from God for someone as a warning but we can't close ourselves to it because that could be blocking the very encouraging word or warning. Now, the third thing he does is to confirm. He wants to confirm what he's saying. Look at 1 Timothy 4.14. God uses prophecy to confirm what he's doing. Don't neglect your gift. This is Paul who led Timothy to Jesus. He says, don't neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy, when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So we, unfortunately, because he's writing a letter to a guy he knows, we don't know the details. But somehow, when they were praying and affirming that, that Timothy was called to do something, something came out of one of the leaders, of what God was going to do in Timothy's life. Now, here's the weird part. Paul has to encourage Timothy, hey, God spoke to you and confirmed something, you're not doing it. So so prophecy isn't the only thing. But in this moment, it was a transforming thing for Timothy and God used it to encourage his life. But Paul still needed to come back and say, God has gifted and enabled you. Remember when we laid our hands on you? But you're not operating in it. So prophecy isn't everything, but it's not nothing, if that makes sense. It's part of God's work. It's not all of God's work. And sometimes what God will do is he's already stirring in your life or he has something for you. And this is why it's so important that above all, we're open to it. And above all, Paul says, if there's anything I wish you could all do, I wish you all could prophesy. Why? Because it's encouraging or it challenges. It's it's a word of warning or it could be confirming. This, this happened in my life. I was in middle school, and we were in a church gathering, and it was on a Sunday, and it was a guest speaker. And at the end, they were having prayer time, and people were praying for people. And he, the guy leading, wasn't a part of our church, looked over at my brother and I and said, I need to pray for these kids, and I need to pray for their family. And so he just brought us over, and it was simple. And he's like speaking to my mom and dad. And I remember being there hey, you just need to know, I just have this sense from God that he's going to do something. My touchy-feely moment. (laughs) One of these weeks, I'm going to make it through. But (laughs) not this week, so (laughs) strike it in your calendar. But this moment where God was saying, I'm going to use them, and his word was to my parents, hey, you're training and you're instructing them, You just need to know, don't give up. God's going to use these two kids in, and here was the phrase, similar but unique ways. That's vague. He didn't say, I'm going to use him to be a civil engineer. Like, it it was just similar but different ways. And you know what? When I look at my life and my brother's life, God's used us in similar. So when I get, like, discouraged, what, what do I do? I can look back and, and get over my crying fits. But I can be encouraged to say, wait a minute. I didn't want to do this. There's a lot easier jobs than this, believe it or not. I don't just talk for 40 minutes a week and then go home and play Xbox. You know, this is something I wish I could do this. This is so awesome. You work once a week and you golf for six, you know. I golf for two, okay. (laughs) Steve's my accountability partner. 
my, my point is that God sometimes gives us moments of himself so that later on when it gets hard, Paul's word to Timothy, Timothy was going through a hard time. And, and that moment that they had had probably years prior was a defining moment that Paul could say, hey man, don't give up. God's using you. Don't neglect God's gift. So I hope at this point, prophecy is a little less weird and man, more enticing because that's, that's the goal. All right, so how do we make room for prophecy? Let's get to us. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Two or three prophets should speak or those engaged in the work of prophecy lowercase p, mind you, and all the others should weigh carefully what is said. So his instructions to the church here are actually hard for us to apply, and I'll explain. But his word to them, if you read all of his instructions in chapters 12, 13, and 14, prophecy is not supposed to be the center of everything. As a matter of fact, he says, you guys have to shut it down. Two or three max, in turn, and move on. The center of worship, as you read Corinthians, is the bread and the cup, the presence of Jesus, worship and teaching of Scripture. That's to be central. It's not supposed to be everyone comes and contributes and it's wild and it's out of control. As a matter of fact, Paul's word to Corinth is slow down. Now, so you say like, oh, good, let's slow down. No, 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 no. Because they're on the opposite side of the spectrum of where we're at. You could take the same 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and that would tell us speed up. Because they were over exercising and we're probably under exercising. So which is why 1 Corinthians is a tough one for us. How do we make room for prophecy together? I'll start with a disclaimer. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how we do this here. And, and the reason I say it with all honesty, and we've met as elders and leaders, and like, we don't know. We do know we want to make room for more, but we don't know how to exercise it in a community that's gotten this large. Because, because for some of us, this is a brand new experience. Some of us, you're not even following Jesus. You're still caught up in the story of the guy smoking weed and wondering, like, how did you know that? And that's totally cool. Some of us are brought up in traditions where this was absolutely part of the weekend gathering and someone speaking in tongues and everyone being silent and then waiting for an interpretation and then someone else and others and then prophecy and all that and healing is part of the normal experience. Uh, others, you're just like, I don't even know what to make of any of this, but I'm, I'm willing to hear more and that's why I hope you are. they are just willing to give an open listen to what God might be saying. But the, the challenge for 1 Corinthians 14 for us to apply is at least twofold. Number one, the size. When you read 1 Corinthians 14, he's giving instructions to a church that's probably 60 people, maybe 100. We think of Corinthians as a mega church. When he's writing to them, they're meeting in homes, and architectural findings have found you probably couldn't even get 100 to 150 people in someone's courtyard. So he's writing to people who are meeting 20, 30, 40, 60, maybe 100 in a house. And guess what? They know each other. He, he helped plant the church. They know each other by name. They know when a, a stranger has walked in because they know her. It's like if, you have, if you're part of one of our 26 West communities, wouldn't you know if someone was new to your group? Yeah, right? You'd know. So his instruction to them is he's writing to people that know each other which means they can easily discern one another. They could call each other out if there's excess. They could tell each other to stop. You know, our, our situation is different. How do we do prophecy when there's hundreds? And I'm going to make an assumption. You don't know everyone here by name. I don't know most of you by name. So how do we exercise this in a way that's encouraging and uplifting when we don't, we don't even know each other? So our situation is quite different, and their gatherings were around a meal and were less structured than ours. It wasn't stages and microphones and rows and cameras. Th theirs is different than ours. What I do know is, at least for now, we have leaders. How do you, if God is stirring you towards something that might be more f than for you, here's what we need to know. Sometimes God is giving us a word in the moment 
that's for us or for me and my wife or for our group and not the whole group. So we have to be discerning. Uh, we need to apply it to our situation first and say, God, is that word in the moment a reminder, encouragement, a warning, a confirmation for me or for just this one person that I know? But it may be for the whole group as a whole. So we're coming at this from different spots. Here's my affirmation to you because after last week, I think it's worth saying that we're very uninterested in chaos. Why? Because we know that Paul says to the church, everything must be done in an orderly way so that when someone comes in who's not following Jesus, they're attracted to the message of grace and not distracted by carnality. So we have to somehow keep the tension of making room for God to speak through us and at the same time uh, lovingly say, wow, now's not the time. So, again, we're going to grow in this. How? God's going to grow us. And he's given those of us who've been given the gift of leadership, lead diligently. So God's graced some of the people in this church to help guide it. Can you just extend a little bit of trust, right? Give a little leash. Calm down. And please, there are many reasons why someone leaves a community. Some are good. Some are, are less good. If you're hearing something that's outside of the Bible, it's okay to ask questions, and if the questions are answered in a way that's out of line with Scripture, that's a good reason to say, man, I don't, I don't want to grow in a false way, you know. But when we talk about us growing and being gifted by God for one another, can we just not say, like, this is new to me and weird, so I'm out of here? Can we, can we be mature enough in Jesus to say that, that maybe I'm going to extend and say, this person has the best in mind and not immediately judge and say, that's just weird and that's not for me. Can we, can we love one another enough to say, like, there's room possibly for more? So I'm not sure how we're going to do this. I just know for now, if you're a part of our church and you know our leadership, and if you don't, you can go to our website and you'll see pictures of all of our staff and leaders, our elders in particular, if God stirs you with something, go to, go, go to one of them during the gathering, after the gathering, reach out and say, I think when we were together, God was stirring this, and, and write it down. Here's why I say write it down. He says, every word is to be judged and discerned. That's why they have to stop and discern what's said. We're so big that if God stirs something, it's not unspiritual to say, in writing it down, I lost what God was saying. Well, I need to share it now. I would almost say, really? Okay, so writing it down, having someone look at it, ask, guide, that's unspiritual. Actually, that sounds biblical. And so what we want to do is it may not be shared in the moment, but it could be that something out of prayer or that happens now is shared at a future gathering. And here's the cool part. God is so big, he can figure it out. And so we want to go lovingly, boldly, courageously, and at the same time with wisdom to not become a free-for-all because nobody benefits from that. If you come to early morning prayer, we've got cards, and it's just in our side room. We invite you an hour before the gathering. Sit, listen, and I, I've, I'm not going to share them this morning, but I happen to have some things that people in our church were stirred about you this morning that we're praying over and going to look over and this is kind of cool when we realize that it's not just songs and sermons, but all of God's people coming together and God using all of us. So more on that in the days to come. I wish I could be more clear. I just can't. So we're a church that just says this is where we're at and here's where we're going. Give us grace. All right, so where do we begin? All right, let's get to us because we got to do something about this. Where do we begin now? Well, 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. So maybe the first thing we could do is ask God to increase our desire. Some of us right now are just saying, I don't even know if I want this. Guess what? God is gracious. He's not going to work through you in the area of giving you a thought or a picture or word in the moment for someone else if you don't believe him. 
So don't feel like God's going to like overtake you and it's going to be weird. But when you're open, say, Holy Spirit of God, you're working in this community and I, it's okay to ask God for more. Here's why. Paul tells the church, I want you to ask for more. I am asking you to desire that God would work in and through you. And if I, I, I've, I've been operating in this kind of way for a long time. So I guess what? I don't turn it on. I don't turn it off. I don't plan to say something that God's going to spontaneously bring to mind. This is not how it works. And there are seasons where it happens a lot. And then there's a season where it doesn't happen at all. And I don't care if God does it through me or through anyone else. I just want God to say what he's saying and us to be receptive to it. So that's what this is about. So don't feel like if you are open and God uses you once, it doesn't mean it's going to happen all the time or in the same way. But we can ask God to increase our desire. And the second, and it goes along with this, where can we begin? We can respond with love. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 2. The whole chapter about love is in the middle of a conversation about gifts and prophecy in tongues. And right in the middle, he has to insert a really long statement about the importance of love. Here's why. Apart from love, we're going to hurt one another. And so he says, if you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if you have faith that can move mountains, but you don't have love, I'm nothing. In other words, love is the goal, not gifts. The reason God works through us is so we can build each other up in love. And so this goes two ways. If if you feel like, man, should I be open to more of God working through me? Here's why I, I can answer yes. Because his giftedness or his expressions of himself are just love. That he loves someone else, he's gonna use you in their life. He loves you enough that even though you got baggage, God works through sinful people. If you mess up this week, that doesn't disqualify from being used by God. He actually works through imperfect people. And that's just love. It's love. And then if you're on the receiving end, if someone gives you something that they think might be from God, and you're like, I can guarantee you this is not from God, it's okay to say, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. I'll pray about that. We we don't have to be unloving and say like, what was that? Or, "Mm, that can't be right. That's that's very discouraging. We discern it. uh, My mom used to say all the time, Jose, eat the chicken, throw out the bones. And and by that, there are good things, and there are things you just just don't, you just throw it away. So as we learn to love one another by being open to God's Holy Spirit, it, it requires that we grow in love. Because I guarantee you, I'm gonna mess it up. That's okay. Hear this. When we invite God to to work, we're not going to always get it right. He tells the church, you got to discern because you're not going to get it right. And that's okay. Trust the scriptures always. Be open to God, moving by his Holy Spirit. Discern words in the moment. That's a beautiful thing. We need both, both in. What do we do now? We just make room so Here's what I'm going to invite you to do is as we enter into worship, prophecy isn't the only thing that happens. But if God stirs you on something that he may be saying for yourself, write it down. If he stirs you for something that he may be sharing for someone in this room or not, write it down. If there's something that you think may be for our church, a word of encouragement, an an exhortation, a buildup, write it down. And then give it to one of our leaders, myself, Steve, Scott. If you're an elder, well, just to keep, keep it simple because they might not even know who you are. Could you just stand up, an elder or, or your spouse as well? Could you just, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but there you go. Um, we have some of them here, Jim Miguel, Steve and Vicky, and Scott and Orlina, and myself, and Carmen, and some of our others. I don't, I don't see you, but like, okay, you can sit down, thanks. Like, they're, they're just brothers and sisters who, human, love Jesus. Go to one of these men and women and just say, I think this is what God's doing. And just trust that we're going to pray over it. And if it's right for the group at the right time, it will be shared. If we think it's more for us as leaders, we'll receive it with joy. If we're not sure, we'll just hold it. 
can we just like, let's just grow. And if all of this sounds kooky, I'll be the first to confess it does. Um, this is not the litmus test of you being a part of this family. You can completely say, I don't, I'm not sure if any of this is right. You're welcome. You're part of this family. We love and want you to feel like you can be anything in this community. You do not have to accept this to say, like, this is my church. You can say, like, I'm not sure and still feel welcome. Okay, so we're not going to make this the inner out. Jesus is the inner out. Good news is the inner out, all right? Lord, I have tried <laughs> and flawed in, in, my, in my way of sharing what I think you're trying.